Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the State of the Bird for the first quarter of 2023. Uh, this one we've subtitled the Status of the Status, uh, which that'll make a whole lot more sense in a little bit here. So, a uh, little primer, what is the State of the Bird? It's a presentation to explain what's going on with the project, um, and it's an interactive event for the community. Uh, we're doing stuff a little bit different this time around. We decided to do it at my normal streaming time rather than... Um, the earlier time we've been doing it at just trying to see how is this gonna get a more active audience whatever we'll, we'll see what happens um yeah all right oh uh, i should mention here it's not here uh, if you look uh beneath the slides here you can also see that there is um a text that says you can type exclamation point ask and a question and you'll get put into a queue which i will be answering questions at the end of the presentation so all right let's start with the retrospective so our last day of the bird, I forgot to update the slide. Whoops. <laughs> All right, so our last day of the bird was January 21st or so, I think. Um, and um, our next one's suddenly scheduled for June, let's see, uh, June 22nd-ish. Or we, we typically go for the third Thursday, my fault. That would be June 15th. Um, I know. Sorry. If you can't tell, I've been super busy, so I'm not as prepared as I should be. Um, it should be July, because June is the end of the quarter. Um, so it would be July 20th would be the tentative date for the next one. All right. Now that we got that out of the way. Um, all right. Let's start with some metrics. So contributors. This is the number of contributors we've had across all our projects for each quarter. Uh, this quarter, we've added one new contributor. Uh, this is mostly uh, somebody that's been helping out and uh, updating HG Keeper. HG Keeper is um, the piece of software we use for hosting our material repositories. Um, so, yeah. All right, next up, review requests. Um, we're a little bit lower than normal. Well, I shouldn't say normal. We're, we're about average, right? If you average those out, I should probably put a trend line or something on this. Um, but uh, um, so we opened 259 review requests and we closed 263. Um, so we had a little bit of a, um, a backlog, I guess, somewhere. I'm not sure where it's from, but either way, <laughs> we closed more than we opened. So that's good um but yeah so you know going back to last quarter or going back to q3 of 2022 that was obviously you know a ton of stuff happened that quarter but you know we did a fair amount this quarter so it's not so bad all right number of issues so in the first quarter here we opened we had 75 issues opened and we closed only 30 of them at first when i looked at this i was like what happened and then i realized oh this is when I entered all the tickets for the uh, um, um, for the roadmap for the alpha. Um, so that is why there was so many new issues there. I'm still not, I don't remember why Q3 had so many too. Um, but the reason we're so high and haven't closed so many is because that's all precisely for um, tracking the alpha and stuff like that. Um, so yeah. All right. So commits. Uh, pigeon commits stay pretty much where they're expected to be over the past couple quarters anyways, um, which is a lot, <laughs> right? Um, so we didn't quite hit 200, uh, but um, yeah, you'll notice there's a new project on here called Hassle. We'll get more into that later. Um, but yeah, so that had 35 commits, G plugin at 11, Talking 2 at 14, and Pigeon 2 had a whopping three. Um, again, we'll get into the specifics of each project later, but um, you can see the pigeons uh, trending down a little bit, but you know, everything ebbs and flows it is what it is. So, all right, infrastructure. I was trying real hard. <laughs> the email is still technically running at Wicktel. Thank you, Richard, for being ridiculously patient with me on this. Um, there's one thing left to do for email, and that is to figure out all of our services that need to send email and all the people that need to receive email and i just need to get that list built and put together and to richard who is now going to be who's going to be hosting a relay for us and stuff like that i just need to get that done and it just hasn't happened because of any one of a number of things so yeah all right uh pigeon two we didn't release anything so nothing to do there right um we had some minor commits, uh, 
I think a memory leak in or fixing a memory leak in uh, uh, something that rarely gets called, so it's not pressing enough to push a release on its own, stuff like that. Um, that's about it. Um, all right, Pigeon 3. This is where the big stuff always comes from. All right, uh, so for start, for, so first we talk about the maintainability. This is stuff that has been problematic and we either like made it easier to deal with or we just got rid of it. So you're gonna see a lot of removed and a lot of migrating and stuff like that. Um, and again, if anybody has any questions, remember you can type exclamation point ask and then your question and you'll get queued up. So at the end of the presentation, I can go through your questions. Um, all right, so uh, for starters, we remove the XMPP user directories and searching of user directories. Um, XMPP is the only thing that actually use this right now. Um, and we're probably gonna add better support for this because you know modern protocols like Slack, uh, Discord and some other stuff, they have ways to search for users and stuff like that. We don't, we don't really have an API abstracted for it or anything. Um, so the XMPP stuff worked, but it was weird and nobody uses the XMPP stuff anymore. Or nobody implements those, uh, th that part of XMPP anymore. So it's just, mm, get rid of it, it's gone. Um, like it, it's, it doesn't do us any good to keep it is <laughs> ultimately the thing. Cause like the, the service you're supposed to talk to for it doesn't exist anymore. So yeah, <laughs> there's no reason for us to have the code. Uh, next up we removed Cyrus Sassel and G Sassel. If you look at the names, you might understand why, uh, Cyrus Sassel was a Sassel library we've been using for a really long time. It was optional. And then like a year ago, we made it required. Um, but we ran into a bunch of issues with it as we we're trying to add um, um, SASL support. Or SASL stands for Simple Authentication and Security Layer, I think. Um, and uh, it's it's meant to like abstract out different login methods. So like you as a client or server, you just say, hey, go SASL, here's the info I have, go get me logged in, right? Um, and then it, it can do all a bunch of different mechanisms for trying different types of auth and stuff like that. Um, so we, we did a test run of porting, I think it was the IRCv3 plugin to GSASL, that's GNU SASL. Um, and it went a little better, but we ran into a, a bunch of issues with it and stuff like that. We'll, we'll talk more on this later, but like we ran into a bunch of weirdo issues with Cyrus SASL and we ran into a bunch of additional, but different issues with GNU SASL. Um, so we got rid of them and did something different, which we'll talk about later. Um, aside from that, we also removed the remaining stun turn and NAT PMP API slash code. That is all stuff for NAT traversal. Um, so for uh, file transfers and uh, voice and video and stuff like that. Um, if you've been here around here a while, you know we started a library called Traversity uh, for doing NAT traversal at a client level where we, uh, um, where we can abstract it out and do stuff. There's a whole reasoning behind that i'm not going to spend too much time getting into it um we we haven't done a whole lot with traversity yet because there's lots of other higher priority stuff to do but with the intent of moving stun turn that pmp um ice and i forget what else ultra diversity there, there's literally no reason to keep it in our active code base i mean we can always review the code again because it's in version control but we we don't need it being part of our build today because we're not using the code right now and it's going to get deleted. So we just deleted it now. Uh, we also finally set our C standard to C17. Um, way back in about 2007 or so, I think we finally moved to uh, the C99 specification or standard. Um, so C17 is the current most up to date one. Uh, we purposely went to that because why shouldn't we, right? Uh, anything that's broken by that standard, we should be fixing and getting it out the door, right? We, we don't want that old crufty crap st uh, sitting around anymore. So we just set the standard. So there we go. Um, next up, we started replacing the status API. Um, I'll touch on that a little bit more, I think, on the next slide. Um, the status API... Uh, needed to hit the, the existing status API needed to hit a lot of weird corner cases, but it only needed to do that like 1% of the time. So the new API simplifies everything and deals with those corner cases in a different way. Um, again, we'll touch more on that later. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to ask um, because I don't, I don't want to get into the whole API discussion and structure exactly, <laughs> but yeah. 
Um, all right, we also made everything warning level two clean. And what that means is um, there's different like warning levels you can set for your compiler or specifically in Mason. Um, I know CMake had it too. Um, I don't know what the like canonical term is for it, but whatever. It's a certain level of C uh, of compiler flags that will set certain warnings for your project, right? So like uh, unused parameters in a function um, and other stuff like that, right? Um, so when we move to the C17 standard, we also upped the warning level to two on everything, all of our projects, everything everywhere. Um, so there was a whole lot of BS we had to deal with because of that. Uh, lots of marking functions for callbacks and stuff or parameters in callback functions as unused and stuff like that. But the code base is better for it, right? It, it was kind of tedious to do, but it was worth it for maintainability. Um, all right, next up, uh, we started replacing all of the GTK tree views, which are deprecated in GTK 4.10. Uh, none of the devs are actually on GTK 4.10 yet. Um, because, well, I mean, I could go to it because it's in Debian Experimental, but uh, nobody else is on it yet. But GTK 4.10 has deprecated a lot of stuff. And we're trying to do as much of that before we actually get to that point because we're just going to get bombarded again with warning fatigue. Um, we already have quite a few warnings in our code base. Um, and then just getting a ton of deprecation warnings on top of it again is going to suck. We spent a long time ago getting rid of a lot of those. And 4.10 deprecates a lot of stuff, not just GTK tree views, which we use all over the place. Uh, but there's additional stuff like GTK widget show gta widget hide those have been deprecated and a whole bunch of other crap and we're trying to get to that before you know we uh actually update to that version of the library so yeah all right uh we also removed the old irc plugin remember we've been building an irc version 3 plugin um so we finally decided well the irc plugin is going to get deleted anyways and the code's in version control so why are we continuously updating it and maintaining it to continue working with all of the backend changes we're making when we're just going to delete it. So with that in mind, we deleted it. Um, also, we deleted the Facebook protocol plugin. Um, some of you may know that the Facebook protocol plugin for Pigeon 2 does this crazy Rube Goldberg machine where it downloads the Pigeon 3 source code at a specific revision. This is why we can delete it because they're going from a previous revision. Uh, they extract the source code and the build system out of there. They patch the crap out of it, build it up and build it against Pigeon 2 and then release that. Um, the problem is they have a whole bunch of patches that they apply and, and I don't think any of those patches have made it back upstream to us, which means our version's super out of date, right? On top of that, it's super out of date and we're continuously trying to keep it up to date with all the backend changes and it's not the best use of our time because it's super out of date. On top of that, uh, this uses the MQTT API, API for Facebook um, and there's some movement towards building a new Facebook protocol plugin that just uses the JavaScript API. That's probably where this is gonna go long-term. Um, so again, there's, pl uh, there's future plans to do other stuff nobody's using pigeon 3 right now we're just going to delete it from our code base right um all right next up uh we've migrated i believe all of the request api fields to g objects there might be a few more stragglers i don't remember i don't have a checklist of it or to-do list um the request api is this weird pseudo um user interface abstraction layer so like the protocol plugins can't do anything specific in the user interface so like when they have to prompt a user for info they use the request api and the request fields api will let them build like complicated dialogues with multiple settings and stuff like that and that's all that works uh this is all just bare c structure stuff which means you couldn't call it from another language so now that everything is a g object means that it'll be wrapped properly by g object introspection which means you can call it from another language now um, I think there's still some remaining work there, but I'm pretty sure all the objects are done. Um, but yeah, so that's a, that's a big, you know, movement going forward. Um, we also removed the mood and tune APIs. These are related to your status. Um, in the past, um, some chat protocols would have would allow you to set a mood. You know, angry, upset, depressed, happy, joyful, etc. Right. Um, we really only had support for this in XMPP. Um, and, um, 
the way this is done in modern chat protocols is basically via an emoji on your status um right so you can have like an angry face a happy face whatever right um so that's the way we're gonna start moving towards and that's the way some of the new present stuff gets to um the tune api is as you may have guessed the name's not great uh that was a way to get your what song you're currently listening to into your status as well um i'll touch more on that on the next slide where we're talking about the new status system but uh again there's better ways to handle that now um or th there's different ways to handle that now so that's that's why we're get, going that way and as we're you know we're, we're replacing the status api these things weren't exactly the status api but they were like adjacent to it um so we got rid of them now because again nothing was using them and we need to you know clean up the board so we can move stuff around and blah 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 um aside from that we also removed the gtk plugin prefs uh plugin prefs were similar to the protocols uh where the protocols can't create um uh, can't do anything with the user interface because you know you want the protocol plugin to be able to work on a GTK front end, a QT front end, uh, a Coco front end, etc. Right? Um, we created this idea of plugin prefs many years ago, where there's a a core and UI split for uh, preferences, and the GTK uh, plugin prefs will read the plugin prefs from a plugin and then build a, a, a preference interface out of it. Um, we're moving to a dynamic one based on G settings. Um, so there was no reason, actually that's done, but that was in G plugin. Um, that's why it's not here. Um, so we didn't have a need for this anymore. So we just deleted it. So, okay. Next up, apparently I'm not on the window. Uh, the modernization stuff. Now the modernization stuff is stuff that we're doing in pigeon three to make it so that pigeon can support modern chat protocols. Right. Um, and some of this is a little confusing how it ties into that, but we can, if you have questions again, please type exclamation point ask, and then your question, and I'll explain it after the presentation. Um, but we created the new contact list, which replaced the old buddy list. The old buddy list window is now gone, no longer exists, right? It has been replaced by the contact list and that's the way we're going. It still needs a lot of polish and stuff, but it, it's there, it's getting there. Uh, we redesigned the account manager to use GTK list box. Uh, the account manager was using GTK tree view that's deprecated. We had to move to a new thing and give it a new style, stuff like that. That's the redesign. Likewise, the same deal with GTK room list, but instead of going to a list box, we went to a column view. Um, the pigeon display window, um, which uh, you'll see in the demo here in a little bit, the left side has a navigation pane and that used to be a GTK tree view. Again, it's deprecated. So we moved it to a GTK list view. The plan has always been to go to GTK list view. Um, but that wasn't something we could do when we transitioned from GTK three to GTK four. Um, so we did it to a GTK tree view, knowing we were going to a list view, but we weren't going to go to the list view until after we got to GTK four. We've been on GTK four for a while now. So now we did that last step there. Um, in the new contact list, we added fuzzy searching. That is a very nifty feature that uh, we'll demo here shortly, which uh, I think you all will enjoy if you haven't seen it before. Uh, we created a new Sassel library named Hassel. Um, Hassel stands for the Hassel Free Authentication and Security Layer app or Library. Um, it's uh, the, I'll touch a little bit more on it when we get to its slide, but uh, it it makes Sassel implementation much easier. Um, yeah, uh, we'll get to it when we, or I'll talk about it. Or I'll explain more when we get to the Hassel slide. Um, aside from that, we added member management to Purple Conversation. Um, so previously we only had member management in chats, right? So we had a, a purple conversation base class, then a purple IM that subclassed it and a purple chat that subclassed it. Most chat networks now, protocols, whatever you want to call them, you have membership across any conversation, right? So if you have a DM, a one-to-one -one conversation with somebody, you can leave that DM, right? It's not like, oh, it's just gone. Like, no, th those DMs are chats that have their own ID, stuff like that. They have member list, or you also have group DMs, which can have more than two members, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, so we we built a uh, purple conversation members and uh, an API for uh, for it in purple conversation that works on those conversation members, um, which uses the purple contact info so that we can keep track of everybody everywhere at once. Um, 
we still have to do some cleanup with the purple convert with the purple chat conversation stuff to get rid of that and that stuff um but this should allow for a lot more um better tracking of everything just in general there um because you know you'll be able to get all the members from any conversation instead of the weird hackery we had with the conversations previously like if you had a purple uh conversation or i am conversation you would get the name of the conversation to get the name of the remote user and that's just bad <laughs> right where now you'll just get the member list and go oh okay this one's me so the other one is the person i'm talking to right um and even then maybe we can have a git list without me or something we'll see right um but yeah um, and then, so we also have built the new status API based on top of purple presence and we started converting everything. Um, so I'm not going to try to explain the status system, the existing status system, because I'm not even sure I grok it entirely. Um, but the, the idea here is we have one presence object for everyone that your pigeon, that your copy of pigeon sees, right? So like when you're on discord, for example, all the users on the server, you have a status for them, right? You know if they're available, away, online, do not disturb, if they have a status message, if they're streaming, all that, right? So we, we've we had these purple presence objects that were part of the old status uh, subsystem, um, but they had some weird stuff to deal with purple statuses, which were kind of like templates that you could like hydrate out to like have a specific status for a person. It's, it, it's weird. Um, but now everything's just a purple presence, right? So purple presence, it's got new stuff like an emoji, right? We talked about the mood API um, and how you typically do it with an emoji. So now purple presence now has an emoji property, which is just that, right? So if you, if you have, have the emoji set, we'll show the little emoji next to it. You know, we can put the little uh, uh, CLDR name on it. So it's just like angry or confused or whatever, right? Um, or conflicted, you know, and that'll be fine. It'll work great. Um, then we also have the status messages right there. Uh, the status message previously is buried in all sorts of weird ways, right? Um, and um, we put a mobile property into there, the idle time. Um, we created a new purple presence primitive to replace purple status primitive. Uh, they're pretty much the same, except previously there was... Uh, idle wasn't its own actual primitive, right? So you, your, your primitives are online, offline, streaming away, uh, do not disturb. Um, and we also added idle, right? So idle, idle is a weird thing across different chat networks. Some chat networks, um, you have, um, you, you have like a, a primitive of idle, like discord. If you go idle, you go idle, right? But other chat networks like XMPP, you're available, but also idle, right? So we, we keep track of idle time, I but we, so that you can be away, or so you can be available, but idle. But then we also have an idle primitive so that you can just be idle entirely and not necessarily have a, uh, how long you've been idle for and stuff like that. So the, the status API is really involved, really, intertwined everywhere. Um, but that's just kind of some of the stuff we're trying to get to, trying to get it moved to. Um, but uh, going back to some of the stuff before, remember one of the big things we're doing to represent users everywhere now is via purple contact info. And a purple contact info has a presence object. Um, and that's so that we can represent that presence everywhere and it just stays right with that contact info. And we'll be good to go from there. Um, oh, and then I was gonna also mention before with the Tune API, we don't exact, so previously, you know, there was the whole thing of, we had uh, like separate properties for song title, album name, artist name, album artist, uh, cover art, blah, 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 all that stuff, right? That's a lot of API to add for something. And I'm not sure, like we, we might go back and do it right now, but right now the idea is to handle, um, displaying like what songs you're listening to and stuff is to use the tags object. Um, I wrote a blog post a while ago on how our tag, tags object works, um, but a purple contact info has a tags object as well. And um, so does a purple presence. So you can literally just in that purple presence object for the contact, just say song call or song dash title colon whatever, you know, and then you can just fill out the tags that way. And then the user interfaces can grab those and then do the right thing. So hope that all makes sense. 
All right, for G plugin, <clears throat> G plugin is our plugin library. Um, we pulled this out. Well, I wrote this separately, and then we decided to use it for Pigeon Three a while ago. Um, and by a while ago, I mean like ten years ago. <laughs> um, but uh, so this just manages all of our plugins and tries to do everything that's just at the plugin layer. Uh, it's a separate library, so that you can pull it into your own application and do whatever you want with it. Uh, natively, it supports Lua, Python and native plugins and Vala and Genie plugins. Uh, we have some proof of concept stuff for how to build Rust plugins with it, stuff like that too. Um, the idea is all this is in one place. Nobody else has to reinvent it. It's a library, use it, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, all right, anyways, we released version 0.40.0 on February 24th. Uh, for this, we added dynamic plugin configuration based on G settings. This is why we got rid of the plugin preferences in Pigeon 3 and stuff like that. Uh, there was some additional memory leak fixing um and uh we also bumped the c standard to c17 you know as you would have expected like i said we did that across everything uh for talk to we released talk to 0.2.0 on february 23rd the day before um actually they were, were i think it was the same stream just we crossed midnight turned it um in this one we fixed deprecations from glib 2.74 we bumped our C standard to C17. We bumped the minimum Mason version and modernized our build files. We were a very early adopter of Mason. Um, so we haven't exactly kept up with all of the new developments and best practices or common practices and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, every now and then we got to go through and do that. Maintenance cost, right? Um, we simplified the GTK text buffer subclasses. Um, so previously in Talkatu, if you wanted to represent uh, Markdown in a input widget or whatever, um, you would have to create a talk to markdown buffer. Uh, we had markdown, uh, HTML, uh, a whole buffer formatting, and then just a regular talk to buffer. Uh, we folded the HTML markdown ones down into the talk to buffer uh, because they all basically implement, are implemented the same way. Um, the main difference is it's just how we handle paste and copies and stuff like that. Um, and we don't have that implemented yet. <laughs> the pasting and copying yet because we haven't figured out how to do it on gtk4 yet um but now talk to buffer just does all of that stuff um and then um we still have the whole buffer formatting for stuff like uh setting your default uh text format stuff like that right um because it doesn't make sense to give you a rich format when it's just like no i want my text to have a orange background and a blue text so nobody can read it and everybody gets mad at me right that's, that's what the whole buffer format is for. <laughs> um, and again, we also cleaned up all the level two warnings. That's the stuff like uh, unused parameters. Um, I, there's more to it than that, but I can't remember what it is, but that kind of stuff. But yeah, so that was talk to. Uh, for GNT, we, we haven't released GNT3. Uh, we haven't released GNT2 either. Our GNT2.14, I think, is the last version we released. Uh, there hasn't been any reason to update GNT. GNT is the uh, the Glib and Curses toolkit, which is a bad name because we're not part of Glib, so we should, probably shouldn't be using it, but that's the current name. Uh, but this is the library that's uh, GTK-like, but um, uh, is... Uh, uh, worked on end curses instead of anything else. Um, so yeah, um, aside from that, uh, all right, so we changed the C specification to C17 and we use GI docgen from a release rather than Git. We actually did that across all the projects. There's a, a bug in GI docgen that was um, causing all of our docs builds to fail. So I was like, I could figure this out and send them a patch or I can just use the last release and keep doing what I'm doing. So that's what we did. All right, Traversity, uh, it's still a work in progress and it's not used by libpurple yet. Uh, we did implement the get all interfaces for Windows properly. Um, so now we get all IPv4 and IPv6 addresses on Windows. Um, but again, you know, we're not anywhere near a release and uh, we haven't pulled it into Pigeon yet. So it's not really a huge deal. So yeah. All right, Hassle, we haven't had a release yet and currently only supports the plain mechanism. Um, so what that means is Hassle is a, uh, a, a SASL library, right? The simple or the uh, secure uh, authentication and security layer library. Um, we, we finally decided, you know, like after running into problems with Cyrus Sassel and then running into all sorts of versioning issues with GNU Sassel, 
Um, so GNU Sassel is currently at like version like 2.2 or something, which doesn't sound like a big deal, right? But like some distributions are still using 0 0.8 or something. Some are using 1.0, 1.1, 1.2. It, it's just a big nightmare. And the Sassel stuff we need isn't super complicated. So we decided to roll our own. Um, I really hate having to do this kind of stuff um, because it's just more work we have to do, right? Like I'd much rather depend on a library to do this, but the the complexity involved in those Sassel libraries is ridiculous. Um, so Hassel is a geobject based library. It's very, looks very familiar to all of our other code, um, but it does things a little bit different. Um, in the other Hassel libraries, like you set up like a client and you have to set up a bunch of callbacks to like get different fields and stuff like that. Hassel works by you create a context where you tell it what your uh, username is, your auth Z or auth Z. Uh, that's who is, um, like <clears throat> that's who you're authenticating as. So like, if you don't specify that, you'll just authenticate as your regular auth name. And then there's a password, right? And the play mechanism will just go with that and do the stuff. Um, and then likewise, uh, like you'll pass those same values in if you're going to use Scram. I can't remember what Scram stands for at the moment, uh, but Scrams, there's a whole set of Scram uh, mechanisms too, which we'll be implementing at some point. Uh, those are ones that don't actually pass your password to the server. They do a couple um, secure checksums. Um, that's the SC in the Scram part. I don't remember what the RAM part is. Um, and we'll be implementing those at some point, but uh, so... Uh, yeah, so that uh, the, those things will make stuff easier, that kind of stuff. Also, um, one of the things we were doing in the Pigeon code base is none of the existing Sassel libraries um, will automatically retry mechanisms, right? So the way this typically works is when you connect to a server, a server will say, hey, I support mechanisms, plain text or plain and external. And the, the specifics for those aren't a big deal, um, right? But like... So Pigeon 2 has only ever supported Sassel plain. We don't support Sassel external for reasons that are more complicated than I'm gonna get into right now. Um, so what we would do is, so everybody that was using uh, Cyrus Sassel in Pigeon 2, they would get the mechanism list, loop through them, try one, nope, didn't work, try the next one and keep going. And each consumer or each uh, the protocol or whatever that was using Sassel had to do that themselves and they had to add their own retry logic and stuff like that. So what we instead did is in Hassel, Hassel, when you, cre uh, when you create a Hassel context, you tell it what mechanisms you're expecting or you're gonna support, right? So like when you connect to an IRCv3 server, um, a lot of them will tell you which mechanisms they support or there's a, um, a numeric that'll come back that'll tell you. Likewise, you, the XMPP will do the same thing too. So when you create your, Sassel, your Hassel context, you plop in which mechanisms the server supports. Um, and then you tell Hassel to go and uh, Hassel will look at what's available and what properties you've set on it. So like you'll set your username, your password, blah, 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 right? And then it'll decide which mechanisms to try and which ones are still available and it'll just go and do all that, right? And so basically you create your context and then, um, uh, I don't remember the specifics way it works because I wrote it like two and a half months ago, um, but, um, Hassel will then call you for additional data or when it has data to send to the server and then you will tell it to when you've gotten data back from the server and then it'll just go through that until it's either succeeded or failed and that's it, right? You don't have to retry additional mechanisms. You don't have to deal with all that additional state. Hassel just does all of it. So uh, it's really easy to use um, and we'll probably get a release out soon. Uh, we probably want to get Scram done first um, and then we'll cut a release for it, um, but we're already using it in the Pigeon code base. So yeah. All right, next up, uh, setbacks. We, we didn't really have any. Um, the, the biggest problem we have right now is, uh, so I'm currently working two contracts. Um, so my available free time is less than ideal. So yeah, that, that's our biggest, uh, biggest issue is <laughs> I don't have enough time to work on the project. So yeah. All right, now for a demo. Um, and again, I'm gonna tell you this before we start the demo. If you have any questions to ask, 
please type exclamation point ask and then your question um and they're getting queued up right now so that uh, i can answer them after the presentation all right um we're not going to do a build or anything this is a build of the current pigeon clean tree you can see there's the id the tree is clean um i already built but we'll just do this one more time yep okay so pigeon three looks a little bit different because that's not how you do this <laughs> uh number one there that that's it there's there, there's our two windows right <laughs> um this is by default we go to the contact list the buddy list window is gone we deleted it it no longer exists um the demo protocol plugin is already uh ported to the to contacts and the new status api uh the status in here is a little ugly we know right uh, the intent right now was to get everything here and we'll make it look pretty later, right? Um, this duplicate, I don't remember why there's a duplicate here. We need to figure that out. Uh, the contact list doesn't have any buddies or anything, or doesn't have any grouping or anything, because the idea is that you will be searching for them, right? Uh, so you notice I just started typing, right? My focus was here, right? We can even get rid of this. My focus is just here in the contact list. I'm just gonna type a R. Um, and you're going to notice this is what I was talking about with the fuzzy matching, right? So it doesn't look obvious why Grim should match, but Grim is an alias on the contact or something. I don't remember specifically, and we don't have a way to show it right now. Um, but my name in here is Gary, right? So G-A-R-Y. Uh, Reconaro matches because there's an A right there and there's an R right there, right? Richard matches because there's an A-R right there. And Marcus matches because there's an A-R there. Um, the important thing, if you didn't catch it in right when we were talking about Reconaro's, is there's a bunch of stuff between the A and the R, right? Where these three are all AR are um, subsequent to each other, right? They're right next to each other. Um, the the algorithm we're using for this doesn't matter. What it does is it starts at the start of the string. It looks for the first letter in your pattern. If it finds it, cool. It moves on, tries to find the next one. If it's found all of those, regardless of characters in between it or anything, it returns that match right so if i now add a y to this i still match because my name is gary right that's the alias that's underneath here that we can't see but it still matches because pigeon knows about it um so i still match and reckon still matches because he's got a r y right so that's the fuzzy matching right one of the things we're trying to do is it's not efficient for somebody to go and scroll through a list of their contacts. Like it, you can still do that. Sure. But like for me personally, like with all the fuzzy matching stuff I do in sublime text, I would just want to be like able to go, okay, I want Ian, right? So I can just type E I N and then hit enter. That part doesn't work yet. But then boom, I, there's my conversation to Ian. Right. Um, and I won't have to like go, search through the entire list and be like, where was Ian again? You know, right, just assuming I have like a hundred contacts or something, right? Like where was Ian? Cause maybe I gave him a different alias. So he's sorting different or something like that. And maybe the buddy I, or the avatar will help me out or something, right? But like, just type the name, right? <laughs> type the name and go, right? Let's see, what do we have for matches for, oh, why isn't that working now? Great, I think we just found a bug. Yeah, so, you know, he start, starts for K, but yeah, KS will give us Marcus, KO, yeah, nothing else will match those. Um, I don't think we have anything else, yeah, L only matches that. Oh, O will get us a bunch of people too, right? Um, yep. But yeah, so, uh, that's that part, right? Uh, so this doesn't look too different here, but this is actually a GTK list view, not a GTK tree view. Um, at some point we're going to be adding, uh, additional like, uh, counters and uh, not counters badges in here for like notification count or unread count, stuff like that. Um, everything's in here to do it. We just haven't actually done it yet. Um, so for example, um, right. So like there should be a one here right now because there's a notification here. Um, it's able to do it. We just haven't implemented it yet. So that's, that's on our list of things to do. We're just not there yet. Um, but yeah, so the demo protocol plugin got a few more things here too. I don't remember if this is here or not. Uh, just so we can demo the, uh, uh, accounts connecting or, uh, people adding you to the contact list, stuff like that. Right. 
So like when somebody adds you to the contact list, we'll pop up a notification here. There will be a badge at some point. And then like, if you don't want to add them right away, you can hit message, right? And then, okay, there's the message, blah, blah, blah. Um, we do need to automatically select and jump to the messages and stuff. We'll get to that at some point, but um, it's not a huge deal right now, right? It's a little annoying, but not a big deal. Um, yeah. Uh, aside from that, um, I think we can do that. I should have tested this ahead of time, but I didn't think about it. Um, oh, so the this is the new account editor. I don't think this has changed much. Um, we're still playing around with layout and colors and stuff. Um, we'll see. Uh, that will delete the account. Uh, I think we prompt for it. I hope we prompt for it. Yeah, okay. You get a prompt if it comes up, blah, 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 right? Um, we're still working on the overall flow and UX of this, but we'll, we'll get there at some point, right? Like, this isn't great right now because the add button stays. And, well, you'll see, right? So we're going to add an IRC v3. We're going to say our username is devm. We're going to connect. So IRC v3 by default is set up to be secure, right? It's supposed to be what most users are expecting. But I'm going to connect to a local dev server right now um just to show you sassel working that kind of stuff right um so we're gonna say server is localhost uh require password yes um that's gonna force it to prompt us because irc has an optional password right so if you don't say require password it and it's uh it, it doesn't know to check the password manager or anything like that right because it doesn't want to check the password manager and prompt you if you don't want to use a password right um but then we're going to go to our advanced options. We need to change our port to 6667. We're going to turn off TLS. Again, this is a local server, local dev server. There's no TLS. There's no nothing. Uh, we don't have a server password. Uh, we're not going to set an IDENT name. I'm going to show you something nifty we had, or not, not the IDENT name. We're not going to set a SASL login name. I'm going to show you something nifty we would do with that in a minute. Uh, we're going to force, or we can also specify a SASL mechanism as well to use, right? So like if the server supports like eight different SASL mechanisms and you want to use one of them that's at the end, you don't want to go through and exhaust that list. You just want to go right to the one you know you can support, right? Um, so if that's a use case for you, you can just pop this in. This is also good for us debugging. Um, so like when we want to add, when we so like most Scram is implemented with Scram SHA-256, but some servers also support Scram SHA-384. Um, so we can just plop in SHA-384 in here, or Scram SHA-384, and then it'll only try that one, right? We can put spaces and do multiples, but this gives us a way to quickly and easily test it, uh, which is you know otherwise generally hard. Um, but we do need to tell uh, SASL to allow plain text over an unencrypted connection, right? Because we're not using TLS, we, we need to send the plain text SASL mechanism, we'll send your password in plain text. It's not in clear text, but it's, it, it's, well, this, sorry. It's not in plain text. Like you can't read it on the wire, but it is in clear text because it's like base 64 encoded, right? So like, oh no, you have to get the base 64. <laughs> like you get the base 64 stuff off the network, off the wire, you base 64 decode it and you have the password, right? But it's not immediate. Um, all right, so anyways, we're gonna add the account here. All right, sorry, we're gonna hit save here. <laughs> um, so, um, I missed something, I think. Okay, no. So we did have the password manager on, so it read my password out of my key ring, which I thought that was not set, so I thought I was gonna get prompted for it. But, uh, so there's not much to see here. This is mostly debug as we're still building this protocol plugin. But, right, so uh, successfully connected a localhost, try and sassel plane mechanism, uh ignore those successfully authenticated with sassel plane mechanism right and that's all using hassle right that's a brand new library we wrote in february um that's doing our authentication and it just works and does a thing so yeah um all right so that pretty much covers that part um i'm trying to think if there's been anything else ui wise uh we talked about the room list a little bit I'm, i guess we can pull that up um, so that doesn't automatically get set to, um, transient of this one. So on a tiling window manager becomes big, you can see there's no padding. The window looks kind of, eh, everything's squashed. Again, we're trying to get stuff converted and we'll polish it later, right? The important thing is getting stuff to the new APIs and everything. And then like we, we can go through and do all the polishing and make everything look nice and pretty later. Um, so we're going to use my pigeon chat dot our pigeon chat account we have to specify the conference server so this is going to be conference.pigeon.im 
and then we can get our list of channels. Now this is uh, a GTK column view. This used to be a GTK tree view as well. Um, but yeah, so like we can go join the pigeon development chat room via that. And yeah, we, do, we, we still have to escape HTML, stuff like that, blah, blah, blah. There's a whole bunch of crap we have to do here. Um, there's a whole bunch of crap we have to do everywhere, but yeah. Um, aside from that, the about window, most of this got moved to GTK list views and list boxes, um, where it used to be talking to views everywhere. Um, so that's looking good. Um, I can't, no, I think this happened last time. Um, this is something I wanted to add for a while and QLogic finally knocked it out. Uh, I shouldn't say finally, he just decided to do it and went for it. Um, a lot of the times when users will come to us for support, we have to ask them a ton of questions, right? So we we built into the about box uh, a way to like say what uh, what commit was their version of pigeon built on, what's the version of lib purple, what's their glib version, what's their GTK version. Um, why don't we have the pigeon version in here? <laughs> Did we skip it because of that? Okay, well we need to fix that too, right? Um, and then so on and so forth, right? So like this is what we were built against. This is our runtime information. We need to have the pigeon version in here. <laughs> um, uh, runtime directories. These are all your XDG cache home, config home, and data home, right? That's why it's homegram, local, share, blah, 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 right? Um, configuration, because we have this set up for the built for the dev environment. Uh, we, we set the XDG config home to the dev environment so that we don't like uh, trash our local installs, stuff like that. Um, then, you know, all the GTK settings, all that stuff, but so, you know, forget all that, right? Or like, or, you know, here's everything that was passed into Mason as part of the build, all the options for all of that, right? The, the cool part about this is well, there's now a copy button. There's a copy button per section and there's a copy button for copy all, which you just saw me click, right? So I can click this one or I can click this one. And then, um, uh, where? Right, so the fun part is now an end user can just go to a no paste and put this all in, right? So instead of us having to ask them, what's your version of GDK? What's your version of Glib? What's your blah, 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 right? We we have all this information and it's easy for them to get now, right? The, uh, the plugin search paths is crazy because this is not installed, right? This is just all in our dev environment. Um, and yep, there's all the Mason options and yeah. So we can go, someone can be like, oh, hey, uh, the Unity plugin isn't showing up for me. And we go, oh, well, you built without Unity, <laughs> right? Like somebody needs to rebuild it. Or actually, no, it's not that one. It's Unity integration, right? Um, and that was just set to auto. So that should have built, but that might not be a good example, but right. Or like, maybe they're like, oh, hey, uh, I'm getting this error about what, or like, I can't find a plugin. And, and like, I installed this to blah, blah, blah. And like, all right. So then we go and look at their plugin search paths. And it's like, oh, yeah, that path isn't on your plugin search path. It needs to go here, 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 right? Um, so by default, um, that path's valid, that path's valid. Anything that has build in it is not the uh, the normal path. Uh, local share, Pigeon 3 plugins. Oh, that, that, yeah, that's my local directory. Uh, user local lib, uh, user local lib. Wait, that's in there twice? Where's user lib? Oh, huh. all right. Well, we should probably fix that too at some point. But yeah, so this is just a whole debugging thing. We're probably going to um, set up a no paste uh, that'll be able to handle all this stuff. And then that way people can know it's only going to us. It's not going to sit on paste bin or something forever, right? Um, yeah, so I think that's pretty much about it to cover this. I mean, uh, we saw a little bit of messages here, but the echo bot just echoes. Hello, how are you? Right, just echoes back what it says. Again, we need a lot of stylizing and cleanup across the whole UI. The big thing for, like, as I keep saying, the big thing for us is we need to get to, uh, we need to get stuff functional, right? <laughs> um, we can make it pretty later, that's fine. We need to get stuff functional and moving in the right direction. Uh, the avail, oh, lovely. Well, that's a new one. <laughs> Still highly in development. Um, gonna crash again? I don't know. Um, but yeah, so the status selector, um, this is gonna get tweaked uh, as we finish porting to the new status system. Um, the new status system, the current focus has been on remote contacts and not so much on managing the local, the local pigeon user status. 
Um, we have a lot of ideas on how to do it. We just haven't actually started them or done anything with it yet. Um, so well, I shouldn't say we haven't started it. Um, I wrote a new object for handling save statuses, um, but we need to update everything else for all of that, um, and including the new purple presence manager and a whole bunch of other stuff. But yeah, all right, so that's the demo. Um, there's some other stuff we could cover, but we're just gonna skip it for now because we can. So yeah, all right, so our next steps. Um, the things we'll be working on between now and the next day of the bird. Um, we're gonna finish adding new functionality to the new contact list. Um, stuff like when you double click on the name, it goes to the channel or whatever, right? Um, we should probably get the context menu stuff in too, um, but we need to determine exactly what that means, right? Uh, we need to finish migrating everything to the new contact API. Um, so one of the reasons why we ultimately just deleted the Facebook and IRC protocol plugins was that trying to move them to the new status API and the new contact API was just not worth the effort when we knew they were gonna get deleted, right? Um, because that's definitely not a <laughs> small amount of effort to do that. Uh, in fact, we, I have a pull request in right now to move the Bonjour protocol plugin to the new stat, to the contact API and the new status API all in one pull request because it's just easier to do both of them at the same time. Um, you end up with a bigger pull request, but trying to like, the two are intertwined in weird ways. Um, so trying to do them separately means you're just gonna create more work in the long run. Um, but, uh, so we've had the Sponger protocol, uh, review request in for three weeks now, maybe four. I don't even remember. It's been a while. Um, and we keep finding weird issues with it, stuff like that. It's growing pains and moving between APIs, right? We're getting there. We'll get it figured out. And yeah. Um, next up, we, once we're done migrating everything to the new contact API, we are going to remove all of the old buddy list API all of it um however oh no no we should be fine there um the old buddy list api means that purple buddy purple group purple meta contact and purple buddy list are all being deleted um these are all old api that doesn't necessarily make sense in today's modern chat world um and they cause us a lot of problems um with as we're trying to add new features stuff like that um, I was going to say, I think part of it uh, depends on the status API, but that's wrong. So one of the reasons why we we're pushing the contact and status API at the same time is um, with the old status API, there's a presence type called purple buddy presence and purple account presence. Um, and those are causing all sorts of weird ways with the way the old status system interacts and how it ties to the way that we represent status for remote users. Um, so getting everybody ported to the context API and the new status API is actually going to unblock us from being able to delete the old buddy list API as well as the old status API. Um, and as we get through both of those, then we can go ahead and finish integrating the history API, which heavily depends on the contact API and stuff like that. And all of that will hopefully lead us up to alpha one. Um, and alpha one, there is a link to um, 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 a save search on Utrack, which keeps track of uh, which issues we've tagged as are required for the alpha. Now that list is not comprehensive. <laughs> it does not, that number is gonna go down, it's gonna go up, it's gonna go down, it's gonna go up, it's gonna go down. Um, when it makes it to 100% done, then we'll probably be ready to do the alpha. Um, right now, there's some issues on there that are sized at like double XL and stuff like that because they're things we know we need to get done, but we don't know exactly what's involved in getting them done, right? So that ticket's gonna get exploded out into a bunch of smaller tickets at some point, which means that the percentage done is gonna go down in the short term so that we can get them done and then it'll go back up, right? Um, so it's just project management estimation. It's not, you know, there, there, there's too many unknowns to actually give a release date or anything like that. So that's our working roadmap. Like actually even having a roadmap isn't something we can exactly do because we have too many unknowns, right? We have a bunch of old legacy code we have to deal with and we don't know what that's gonna entail to, you know, or what's gonna be easy to work with, what's gonna be hard to work with and go from there. So yeah. All right, time for the questions. 
All right, I gotta do one thing here quick. Do, 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 do. Um, all right, so. First question is, this didn't work right now, okay, there we go. So, subject change, what will be the first protocol plugin you think Pigeon 3 will connect to in the outside world? Well, I mean, the IRCv3 protocol plugin already works. But, um, do you mean as a third party protocol plugin or what? Like the XMPP one still works, Bonjour still works. Um, so they're there. <laughs> um, one of the other things that's worth mentioning though is, um, we are most likely going to take anything that is proprietary and force it out of our tree. Um, right now, the only thing that's left for that is Gadu Gadu, which I think is proprietary, but there is an open source library for it. Um, so, um, we'll see where that goes. Um, all right, so you uh, elaborate to say you only see the Echo dev plugin. We just connected to IRCv3 in the demo. Uh, it was the local server running on my machine, but it'll connect to XMPP. And we were also connected to pigeonchat.com via XMPP uh, during the demo. So they're there, they work, but yeah. Um, but yeah, so real quick, the, the reasoning for the, uh, the open spec and open source protocols is uh, we, this is specifically why we're doing it, but there's other reasons for it too. Um, but we specifically uh, lost a contributor uh, because they moved to the US on an H-1B visa and the employer that uh, brought them here on that visa decided that, or their legal department decided that they weren't comfortable with them working on Pigeon because of some of the code that's in a legal gray area because of the network reverse engineering that was done to make the plugins work. Um, so, um, we're just gonna make that not happen anymore <laughs> by taking all that code and moving it out of our tree. Um, and then that way that can't happen anymore, right? Um, so that's the idea. All right, next up. What do you estimate is the amount of curtain pigeon users? Unknown. I have no way to estimate it. Uh, this is a question that comes up pretty often. Um, and the problem with it is we don't have any sort of telemetry. We have no sort of metrics. Uh, one of the things I wanna do in Pigeon 3 when it gets released is to add opt-in metrics so we have some sort of an idea. Um, but what I can tell you is this much, we average about five to 6,000 downloads a week on SourceForge. Who or why those people are doing that, why that number's consistent, I have no idea. But here's the deal. The majority of those downloads are the Windows executables. And even if we do end up adding metrics at some point, we're, we download numbers are something we're not gonna be able to use. Because what happens in the open source world is, at least for, I should say specifically for Pigeon um, or other stuff that ends up in distributions. Uh, what will happen is a Linux distribution will download our tarball once, they will put it on their mirrors and they will serve it out to all of their users. To us, we see that as a single download, right? That's it. And there's nothing we can do about that, <laughs> right? So if, if we have metrics in the program and some users are kind enough to turn it on, we can at least get a number uh, but that number is still gonna be super skewed, right? We're, we're not gonna have any idea of like what the real number is. Like we'll, we'll be able to give you a minimum, but even then that minimum is gonna be with a grain of salt because how many of those are the same actual person that has it installed on multiple devices, stuff like that, right? Um, as we look forward and, we er, and we're considering putting Pigeon into the, at least the Windows App Store and probably Steam, um, We'll probably get more metrics out of that. Oh, and uh, the, the uh, uh, whatever the Flatpak site is, I can't think of what it is, Flathub. Um, we'll probably get additional metrics out of that. Um, and that won't, th those will just be from, you know, the stores, um, their metrics. They won't be anything tied to actual Pigeon 3 metrics. Um, so those might be a little bit better, but that's only gonna be one small bit of the user base, right? 
Um, so getting a total number of users and stuff like that, it's it's impossible for us to know. Not unless we put ridiculous tracking and everything, which is just going to drive people nuts. And since we're open source, someone's just going to fork it and remove it. So it doesn't make sense for us to waste our time on it. So I hope that uh, answered your question. Uh, next up, will there be a way to copy the connection info between installs? Um, do you mean between Pigeon 2 and Pigeon 3? Or do you mean across multiple devices uh, with Pigeon 3? Um, if it's from Pigeon 2 to Pigeon 3, um, we're, we're planning some import stuff. We haven't done any work on it at all yet. Uh, but we're planning to have some sort of thing that'll import your Pigeon 2 stuff for you. Obviously not everything is gonna work and most of it won't make sense, but we'll figure it out when we get there, right? That's also why we haven't done any part of it because a lot of it we've ripped out. <laughs> so we'll see. Uh, but for Pigeon 3 to Pigeon 3, um, to sync it across stuff, um, I have some ideas for that. Um, there was actually something I was gonna do a while ago to try to, uh, <laughs> um, try to make some money from was something that would sync your plugin is sync your pigeon directories across machines um but i was trying to do it in like a zero knowledge encryption way and that's really hard um but if we wanted something like there's no reason why there couldn't be a plugin that just like syncs to dropbox or something but like it's gonna get weird so we're, we're pushing for um sql light in a lot of places um specifically the um the contact list will be in sqlite and all of you the logging will be in sqlite um and those don't work well on something syncing at the file system level like um uh like dropbox or any of the shared storage stuff right um but if we're just talking about connections and stuff that could be easier um we are planning on moving the connection info into a G settings object. Um, and one of the benefits there is G settings will also monitor the saved file on disk. Um, where were we playing with this? Was this an old branch of mine? I think it was an old branch of mine. Um, so like as I was editing the file in Vi on in a terminal, like Pigeon was able to see that it changed and update correctly um, for the changes that made. Um, so that might make it easier for that kind of stuff. But um, as of right now, we don't have any big plans, but there's no reason why we couldn't like add an export thing and then an import from file or something, right? Even if that's a plugin, um, that wouldn't be too bad to do if we're just talking about the connections themselves. Um, but again, remember, we don't store any passwords or anything. Um, so then you would have to re-enter all your passwords into your password manager and stuff like that. So there, there, there's a lot of questions there that need to be figured out and answered, um, but I mean, we're not against it. I just, I don't have a solid answer right now. <laughs> it's ultimately what it comes down to. All right, next up, we've got, again, if anybody else has any other questions, by all means, uh, please type exclamation point ask and ask your question. Uh, this is the last question we have. So if none more, or if no others pop up by the time I'm done answering this, we're gonna continue on with the end of the presentation. Um, will the alpha include a Windows build or strictly Linux? So if you go through the list of tickets in the uh, link I sent in chat a minute ago, uh, you'll see that there is create a Windows installer and a Mac installer. Um, and the idea is that the alpha will be Windows, Mac, Linux, and BSD. Um, I'm hoping to also make sure that libpurple3 will work fine on Haiku, but that's more of a stretch goal than anything as the people that are using libpurple2 on Haiku right now are not gonna be anywhere ready to port to uh, purple3, so that's fine. Um, but the idea is that the alpha will be out on all the major platforms um, because we're, we're trying to get people hyped, we're trying to get more people in to contribute and to continue working and you know keep the project going and keep it alive. So yeah. Um, I mean, it'd be easy if we just did Linux, but <laughs> yeah. Um, but right now it's, in theory, it shouldn't be too difficult to do. There's gonna be weird stuff with Windows. There's always weird stuff with Windows. There's gonna be weird stuff with Mac. There's always weird stuff with Mac, right? Um, but we're, oh, actually I should say, instead of just Linux, we're, we're planning a Windows installer, a Mac installer, a Linux flat pack, 
um, where people can add extension, pl uh, can do separate flat packs to add their own plugins um, than the normal Linux stuff and normal BSD stuff that release tarballs, that kind of stuff. So, but yeah, the, the, and the plan is that the Windows, Mac, and uh, Linux flat packs all use all the same versions of all the, de all the shared dependencies, right? So like, there's gonna be like, we're gonna need the Mac SDK for the Mac. We're gonna need the Windows SDK for Windows. Windows is gonna have some additional stuff for like uh, uh, looking at TLS certs under Mac or under uh, the Windows certificate store and, uh, Mac has keychain access for that key ring, right? So, but all the shared stuff like GTK, uh, Glib, um, G plugin, Hassle, all that stuff, they're all gonna be the same version so that we can make it, so that we can better track um, problems across the uh, different uh, platforms. Um, also, it's, it'll make things much easier to debug because <laughs> we just will know what version somebody's at. Right, so if we release 3.0.0 alpha one on Windows, we'll know what uh it uh what the all the versions of all the dependencies were so like we don't have to ask the end user for it stuff like that um that kind of stuff uh it does also mean that building on windows is gonna suck or building up for windows mac linux flat pack are gonna suck because the idea is we're building all of our dependencies for each release um which is gonna take time right but it's cpu time so it's not a big deal um but that stops us from having the weirdo dev directory stuff that we have right now which nobody knows how to rebuild or update, right? So as by doing all this as part of our build system, it's just always there, always being updated, always being exercised, right? So it can't, uh, it can't bit rot because we're always using it. That's the, that's the idea anyway. All right, next up, are we still looking to acquire Windows Dev, uh, win, uh, are we still looking to require an ARM Windows Dev machine? Uh, potentially, um, we're not in any rush for it yet. Um, Basically, until the there's some tickets that's like uh, build all dependencies from uh, Mason or something, or there's there's something specific about Windows for it there. Until we're ready to tackle those tickets, or we have tackled them, there there's not really any use for us to have the extra hardware right now, right? Um, and like we could go through and start doing all that stuff now and figuring out exactly how we need to build our dependency trees and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, that's just gonna create more maintenance for us later, right? Um, because we're not necessarily locked in on specific versions or anything yet, or even specific dependencies, right? Uh, three months ago, we still thought we were gonna use Cyrus Sassel for everything, right? Now we've thrown it out and we threw out the replacement we thought we were gonna use and now we built our own, right? Um, so we don't want to get too far down the rabbit hole with that kind of stuff until we have a much better understanding of what our dependency tree looks like. And we're pretty close right now, I think. Um, there's some weird outliers, outliers right now, like libcmark, maybe gumbo. Um, that might be a little weird. Uh, it gets more weird when we start talking about the plugin loaders from G plugin. Um, because like we're gonna need Python for that and to build C Python for it, right? Um, and C Python moves pretty fast. Uh, and, but they're like six month release or something. So much faster than us anyways. Um, so like, I don't wanna spend a whole lot of time getting like Python 3.11 in there. When I'm in a couple of months, I'm just gonna have to move it to Python 3.12 and I haven't actually benefited from doing that work yet, right? Um, like once we start getting close to actually doing all the builds and stuff for that, then sure, sure, that's fine, right? That, or maybe the alpha just only supports the native plugins, right? That, that might be easier too. I don't know, we'll see. Ugh. All right, uh, if we don't have any other questions, we're gonna move ahead here. Do, 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 do. So closing notes, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, I picked up a bunch of contract work right now. Um, so I have been actually partnering out pretty hard. Um, I actually did a blog post on this. Uh, if you're not aware, I'll, sh uh, share a link in the, uh, presentation here too. Um, oh, and I need to update it on Twitch too. Um, but, uh, right now the blog posts are going to my Patreon. Um, well, I'm currently in the transitioning from Patreon to dev.2. We're still gonna use the Patreon, but the blog posts are gonna be on dev.2. Patreon's gonna to link to them early, blah, blah, blah. Um, but we, I just recently did a blog post on describing the current state of the Pigeon team. 
Um, it's not good or bad. It's just, you know, this is this is the way it is kind of thing. Um, and I also noted that I am pretty much completely and utterly burnt out. Um, but unfortunately, <laughs> I don't think I can stop, at least not until this elf is done, right? Because uh, if I go and take a break right now, any momentum we have, um, as we saw in the metrics earlier, right? The pigeon's momentum, it's slowing down a little bit, right? Um, and right now I am the current uh, most active contributor. And if I stop, or, and I'm also the one driving the new API changes, stuff like that, to try to get everything to where we need it to be for modern protocol, stuff like that and stuff. And if I take a break right now, we're just going to kill any momentum we have, which is why no matter how burnt out I am, where I'm still going to have to work on it. Um, but what that really means is there's probably going to be less Twitch streams um, just because I'm tired, right? Um, I missed a stream recently because I fell asleep. <laughs> I slept through the whole stream. Um, I was sitting with the cats on the couch, fell asleep, woke up. Oh, it's midnight. Missed the stream right it happens right um there's not really any way to solve that unless somebody wants to pay me a full salary right <laughs> uh so i don't have to do the contract work um but it is what it is um so while i was hopeful that we would somehow pull an alpha out by my birthday which is the beginning of june uh that's not going to happen uh my my stretch goal for right now is that we will have the alpha out by pigeon's birthday which is November 18th, but I wouldn't hold my breath, right? And yes, I, re I realize we're talking seven months from now. And I mean, it might be possible <laughs> if I'm working full time on Pigeon and we get uh, some more high quality contributors or a high, not high quality, highly efficient contributors like QLogic and Ivanhoe. If we get some additional ones like them, right, then then maybe, right? But currently we have three active people and a lot of work to do. Um, and that's one of the other reasons why we've been skipping summer code, stuff like that is those are all just um, distractions for us or distractions that are stopping us from getting the release out. So we're trying to do everything we can to get that release out. So yeah, and I just noticed, why is this? Oh, cause I didn't do this. Ugh. All right, sorry. Um, and you're just supposed to be closing notes there the whole time. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of the deal. Um, hopefully something will change. Um, I have been applying to additional grants and stuff like that. Um, and I keep forgetting I have to follow up with one of those applications, uh, basically to try to find ways to fund the project. Um, because if we can fund the project, that means I can spend more time on it, which means we can get it out to all of you sooner. So, yeah. All right. With that, thank you, everybody, for coming by. Uh, typically, with the State of the Bird, um, we don't do a raid or anything on Twitch, so we're just going to cut it here. But thank you, everybody, for coming by tonight. Um, and I hope you all are have a wonderful rest of your day. And